Amen. All right, we're going to be flipping to a whole lot of passages, so if you will just grab a hold and hang on. Um, if you, you know, I know uh, any of you that missed these particular verses, if you want to um, I jot them down, you can. If you want a copy of it later, Emmanuel and Tammy always make copies of all the messages, and you can get a copy of that, I'm sure, uh, and listen to it again and, and run it down later if you can't get them now. Uh, but we're going to begin in the book of Acts, chapter chapter. I had to look back at the second for a second there. Acts chapter 2. And then we're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We're going to be in John 17, Philippians 2, Amos chapter 3, John chapter 17, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, Romans chapter 15, Ecclesiastes chapter 4, and Ephesians chapter 4. So that's why I say hang on, because uh, we're going to look at all those and we're going to try to do it. And yeah, the PowerPoint. Um, need, to, need to go over these as, as quickly as possible uh, so that we can get right into uh, the message. There's a purpose in having all these passages of Scripture, though. Um, just for sake of illustration, this will prove to you something um, about this particular topic tonight about unity. Okay? Notice uh, Acts chapter 2. Uh, beginning verse 41, we know that uh, this is the day of Pentecost and you know all that has taken place and um, and then um, you've got Peter, uh, he's preaching and he's talking about verse 31 of chapter 2, he's talking about uh, he's seen this before, spake of the resurrection, talking about Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither did uh, flesh neither did his flesh see corruption. And then it goes on down and is talking about the church. And notice verse 41. Then they gladly received His word. Then they that gladly received His word were baptized. And the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things in common. They sold their possessions and goods, parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continuing daily with one accord, there it is again, this unity. In other words, they had all things, they were all together, they had all things in common. Um, and it says that they, um, they sold their possessions and their goods and parted them, uh, to all men as every man had need. And they continued daily in one accord in the temple breaking bread from house to house, and did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily as such as should be saved. When you, when you think about this thing about unity, there are many passages, not just in the book of Acts, but all these other passages and many more. I would encourage you, if you've never done a study on unity... You need to do a study on unity because that is one of the things that I believe is lacking in our churches today is this thing about unity. Because so-and-so gets upset with so-and-so and then it just snowballs. you got a whole lot of problems in the church when if we would learn to be in one accord and be obedient to God as He tells us in His Word that we are to be in the same mind, we're to be in one accord, we're to be in unity, uh, in singleness of heart, um, with one purpose, one thing in mind, and that is serving the Lord and bringing Him glory and honor. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, in verse 10, the Bible said, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. And then in John chapter 17 and verse 21, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. Notice what this says. That the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Now, one of the most detrimental things to the church today is this very thing about not having unity. Because the world is looking at us, for example... Whether they're going to admit it or not, by the way, if you mess up, guess who's going to be the first one to say something? It ain't going to be somebody within the church. It's going to be somebody without the church because they're just looking at Christians, hoping they're going to mess up and make a mistake so that they can say, Ha, look at this. I thought you were a child of God. I thought you were a Christian. And look at the way you're living and look at the way you're acting toward one another and treating one another. So notice what it said. That they also may be one in us that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. We're an example. We're a testimony. 
And we are a believer. We're a follower of Christ. And we need to learn the importance of living like a Christian ought to live in reference to our relationship to one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem the other better than themselves. There it is. Nothing is to be done through strife or vainglory. Amos chapter 3 and verse 3. Can two walk together, except they be agreed? Now I want to stop right here. Uh, Brother Eric and myself, we've had uh, discussions a lot. Um, and I remember one time having this same discussion uh, with him. And it has to do with sometimes people don't get along. And sometimes, well, we, we talked about this. He's probably looking at me like, what, what are you talking about? I'm not making this connection yet. And I can see that in his face. But as soon as I mention this, uh, I think it will click in his mind. Uh, do you remember a man by the name of Paul and Silas? I'm sorry, Paul and Barnabas, because Paul and Silas came later. Paul and Barnabas. On the first missionary journey, they took a young man with them. Yeah, you don't want to talk about that. He's shaking his head. Uh, they took a young man with him, with them by the name of John Mark. And just a little ways into the missionary journey, John Mark decided, oh man, I'm homesick. I'm going back home. So he left and goes back home. Well, later, they're getting ready to go on another missionary journey. And all of a sudden, here comes John Mark. I want to go with you. And Paul's like, uh-uh, wait a minute. No, not going to happen. You, you backed out on the first journey. We're not, you're not going on this one. And so what happened was, Paul said, I'm not taking him. So Paul took Silas and Barnabas took John Mark. Guess what? The gospel went two different directions. You see what I'm saying? So sometimes the gospel is spread even when there's division. All right? And, it's, and we're able to spread the gospel. But here's the thing. Most of the time, the division that we're talking about is not that kind of division. Most of the time, it is, man, Dan said something that just upset me, and so I'm going to go behind, my, behind his back and talk about him to somebody else rather than going to him myself and doing the biblical thing and saying, hey, Dan, you've offended me. You see what I'm saying? I mean, we, we so often, we go and talk, tell somebody else something that we ought to be going and talking to that brother or sister about and straightening those things out. And because we don't do it God's way, there is division. And that division multiplies many times over and over and over again. I'll give you this illustration. When I, was, um, when I was growing up, um, my pastor, Brother Jack Rollins, he was and still is one of the most committed, dedicated men of God that I've ever known. Uh, Brother Jack loves the Lord. He preaches the Word of God even in his 80s now. He still fills in for different churches. He's full, out of the ministry full-time. When I say full-time, he does not have a full-time church. But he preaches full-time because he's all the time filling in for people all around and uh, Brother Jack, think about it, he still preaches the same day that he always has. Um, I've known him ever since I was two years old. Of course, obviously, I didn't really know who he was while I, when I was two years old. But uh, he has been my pastor from the time I was two years old all the way until I went to college. And, um, and I remember one time there was a problem in the church. And um, we had one of the deacons in the church that decided, hey, I don't like the way Brother, Brother Jack's preaching. By the way, he was preaching biblical truth. It was not something that, um, you know, that we would consider, oh, the preacher did something wrong. It wasn't that it had anything to do with that. It all had to do with certain subject in the Bible, the fact that that deacon didn't like what he was preaching on. And he, he said, you're harping on this and, you know, whatever. So anyway, um, we ended up... Uh, I remember very, very vividly, I was 14 years old, and um, you know, I walk into the hallway and I experienced something I never thought that I would see among believers. I saw a deacon cursing his pastor. By the way, we got some good deacons here, right? <laughs> These are the salt of the earth men, and, and that would never be the case here. But I'm just telling you, it is this happens. This happens. And, uh, and the deacon basically invited the pastor to come out into the, into the parking lot, and he was going to take care of him. And uh, by the way, there was also a letter that this deacon sent to this pastor uh, that was not good. And, um, so, and he had proof of that. As a matter of fact, um, basically my, my preacher said, hey, this has happened, and if you want to see the proof of it, here it is right here. But anyway, uh, one of the other deacons kind of, took in, you know, kind of came in uh, to rescue him, and, uh, and said, nobody's going to be served. Said, the preacher is stepping outside. If you want to step outside, that's me and you step outside. And then that was the end of it right there. So, uh, but anyway, 
things just blow out of proportion sometimes. Never would I have thought that would have taken place in my church, in my home church, but it did. And um, the, the, what happened, eventually what happened was there were probably about 15 families. By the way, I had a large church that I grew up. We had like 350, 400 people. Um, there were about 15 families that said, we believe this guy's telling the truth, and so we're going to go with them. And they started another church. And by the way, that church was okay for a little while. And then guess what happened? They had some division among themselves, and finally the church building was sold. And anyway, just a bad situation. So it is never, in this case, it is not a good thing for, for to have division in a church. Amos chapter 3, can two walk together except they be agreed? John chapter 17, verse 23, I in them and thou in me, that thou may be perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved me, them as thou hast loved me. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. Finally, brethren, um, farewell. Be perfect. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the love of God, I'm sorry, and, and the God of love and peace shall be with you. Romans chapter 15, verses 5 and 6. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus, that you may be with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 and verse 12. And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him. A threshold cord is not quickly broken. You see what that verse means? Is there is strength as we bond together in unity and in harmony. It is when we are not in harmony and when we're in disunity that, uh, that we cannot prevail uh, in this thing. And then in Ephesians chapter 1, and we're going to stop after we read these six, first, these six verses. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherein you're called, with all lowliness of I'm sorry, all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Notice what he said. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. You know what that word endeavoring tells me? That it's not an easy, t easy thing sometimes. Sometimes it's not easy to be in one accord. Sometimes it's not easy to, uh, to, to step back and say, you know what, God's will is that we be in unity and harmony together, uh, and sometimes it's very difficult to do. When you look at verse 1 in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he calls the church to remember where they came from. He called them to remember uh, where they came from. Uh, Turn, turn if you will. You know what? I think I just read you the, the wrong passage. Did I read the wrong passage? No, I did not. I just want to make sure. Because I had typed it or printed it out, and I just wanted to make sure I didn't give the wrong passage. Uh, Paul encourages the church to remember where they came from and what God had done for them in Christ. He uses the word, therefore. Notice what it says. I, therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, beseech that you walk worthy of the vocation uh, wherein you're called. So he uses the word therefore basically to call to their minds that he has taught them in the book of Ephesians, or what he has taught them in the book of Ephesians. He's been writing about doctrine. He's been writing about faith and belief and uh, precepts, things that God wanted them to hear. And now he turns his attention to something that is very practical in the way that they ought to live their life based on what they have been instructed thus far. This is the way that you ought to behave. This is the way you ought to live your life. And if the phrase at the end of verse 1 says, walk worthy of the vocation wherein you're called. It is, it is worth it to live out our faith. Not just to say, I'm a follower of Christ. Well, when the rubber meets the road, as you've heard me already say in the last couple of weeks, it's when our faith is put to the test. It's when our, our commitment to Jesus Christ in reference to how we relate to one another as children of God. This thing about unity is important. 
Paul uses the word vocation, and it really refers to a calling. So what have we all been called to? What have we been called to? Glorify the Lord. To glorify God. That is what we're called to do. We are to trust Christ as our Savior, follow Him, and in doing so, we're giving God glory. And so the calling that we receive from God uh, by Christ it is a faith that it is not just something that we treat as a fly-by-night thing. It's not something that we think, oh, you know, I can do this or not do this. This is, you know, this is just no big deal. Paul is trying to encourage the, the, Christ, the Christians there at, at Ephesus and encourage us to realize the necessity that we live out our faith as it pertains to our brothers and sisters in Christ. This thing about unity is important. And we already read where it's important because we not just for ourselves, the unity in this place, but these people in this world that don't know Christ, they have got to see that unity. They've got to be able to see, hey, they don't just say they're a Christian. Man, look at the way they treat one another with love and unity and harmony. Man, we, our world today, we, among Christians, there's so much fighting and quarreling, and I know it's not pleasing to God. And we begin to point and say, well, I don't believe like this person. And we do whatever we can to tear that person down. And they're a child of God just like we are. And not just in this local place, but we, you know, we focus on so many things that, we're, that, that are our differences that we, we, were, we neglect the fact that we are in unity. We're to be in unity with our brothers and sisters in Christ. So it is a calling. It is a lifetime thing. Paul is trying to get them to understand this. It is our life's purpose, if you will. And that is to glorify God by how we act and react to our brothers and sisters in Christ. We have received a calling from God. And it's not just a fly-by-night thing. It's something that we're to be committed to. It was a call to live a changed life for the glory of God. We're called on to live differently because we know who Jesus is and we've committed our lives to Him. We are to live our lives that is worthy of our calling. And I dare say that there are some folks that name the name of Jesus Christ that are not walking worthy of their calling. They're not walking worthy of the calling wherein they're called. The word worthy comes about to mean to balance the scales. We are to live in a life and live our lives in a way that we prove who we belong to. To prove who we belong to. We belong to the Lord. We are to live our lives to glorify Him in this world and we're to live in such a way uh, that uh, we're to live such weighty lives that we balance the scales tipping folks toward God. <coughs> tipping folks toward a relationship with Him. Folks, I want to tell you, sometimes we are not the example. We are not the, the uh, testimony, not just as individuals, but particularly as a church, as we should be. Um, having told basically what God expects of us, Paul then moves to tell us, how are we supposed to bring this to pass? How are we supposed to get along and glorify God in this way? He teaches these verses of how to walk worthy of the vocation wherein we're called. One of the ways that the church can prove the reality of, of what it teaches is by the way that we treat one another as we live out our lives for the glory of God. He mentions in verse 3, and again in verse 13, this idea of unity. The word means agreement, simply that we are to walk together as one in Christ. We're to walk together as one in Christ. That is the goal, or one of the goals of the church. Folks, I've said this over and over again. I preached this thing about unity several, probably about three months ago. I used a different passage. But this thing about unity, um, it should be our goal. And I believe that one of the reasons God blesses a church, hence, one of the reasons God has blessed this church is because of unity. And folks, I'm not saying that we have to always agree on everything, because we don't. You know, you may have an opinion about something. I may have an opinion or something about something. But here's the thing. We cannot, we must have unity. We cannot be in disagreement on what the Bible says. When it comes, listen, Dan and I may have a disagreement on something, 
I keep using Dan as an example. You know why I do? Because you're like running my line of sight. Meet you outside, bro. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, you know, we think about this thing, you know, we may have a disagreement on something. Dan may say, you know what? I would rather play um, an acoustic guitar. I'm sorry, well, I like electric guitar. All right? You know, we may have a disagreement on stuff. That doesn't matter. Those kind of things are silly. doesn't matter what color carpet you have, although I wouldn't want pink, purple, pur polka-dotted carpet in a church. But, I mean, you know what I'm trying to say. There are things that when it comes to eternity, it does, does not matter. It does not matter. But this is what matters. God's Word. That is what we cannot disagree on. We have got to be in harmony and unity, promoting the Word of God, loving one another, loving God, and moving on for His glory and His honor. The book of Ephesians... Basically, it's about God's grace. It reveals itself in salvation. And when you think about this thing about uh, God's grace, God's grace brings about unity among believers. And um, so when we think about this thing about unity, there's a couple of things that I want us to mention. And I'm trying to hurry because I know I don't have time to finish everything tonight. Uh, but I do want to get in the main points. Um, the church has no greater testimony than when we're all united in Christ, in spite of our differences. You see, again, we're not all the same. We're different. Every one of us are different. Uh, there's not one person in here that's just like somebody else. We may have similarities, but when it boils down to it, we're all different. And, um, and so we've got to learn what it means to keep the bond, the unity of the Spirit, and the bond of peace. So, um, when you look in the book of John, chapter thirty-five, chapter 13, and verse 35, it said, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love, one for the other. And then in John, chapter 17, verse 11, And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are one. You see, God's will is for us to be in unity because He and the Father are in unity. And therefore, He expects that of us because we are a child of God. So, um, there are a diversity among us. There is a diversity among us. We're different. Uh, we are different from one another uh, in probably a lot of ways. Uh, physical differences, intellectual differences... Uh, when I look at each one of us, not one of us look the same as the other. Uh, intellectually, uh, some people are have a little more upstairs than others do. And I'm, I'm actually looking at myself as the one that's got the lower end of that spectrum. Uh, so I'm not trying to point any fingers at anybody else. But some people are a little better intellectually than others. Uh, there are economic differences. Uh, there are spiritual differences. Some people, uh, when you think about spiritual growth, are a little farther ahead than other people. There are some that are babes in Christ, and then there are some that have been Christians for 30, 40, 50 years. And so there's such a diversity. Yet, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, God tells us in His Word that we are to keep the bond of peace, that we're to keep this unity among us. And um, so it's important. Even though we have a lot of differences, we have one thing in common. Garrett is my brother in Christ. Chris is my brother in Christ. I can go all the way around the room. Hannah is my sister in Christ. That is such a... It's, there's something about saying that about you and about me. We are a part of the family of God. And that is something... That is a bond that just kind of surpasses everything. We realize that we're a part of the family of God. And you know, I, I always, folks, if you knew my heart, if I could really tell you what I'm feeling right now, if I could get that across based on what we've read in the Word of God, I always want this place to be that kind of place. I always want us to be in unity and harmony, but I also never want us to neglect truth. I want us to stand on the Word of God, and if it offends, then it needs to offend. But we're to keep this bond of unity among us. Standing on the Word of God, standing on our faith in Christ, moving forward, reaching these people that need to see this unity in the bond of the Spirit. Walking in unity does not mean we always have the same ideas about everything, about all the same issues. We may have differences of opinion from time to time, and that is healthy and good. There needs to be a diversity of thought and, and spiritual, uh, spiritualness and so forth as far as uh, that goes. 
But you know what? There ought not to be one person that says, I'm going to run the show. We ought to be in unity and harmony, preferring one another before we do ourselves. And that, and listen, folks, there are times, and I'm not talking about truth, about you know standing upon the truth, but there are times that we are just so, uh, for lack of a better term, such a totalitarianism, mystic person. I'm trying to think of a way to say that. In other words, we think it's my way or the highway, and we're unwilling to prefer our brothers or our sisters before ourselves. And therefore, we are not keeping this bond of unity in the Spirit. We've got to learn what it means to be humble and sometimes to take a step back if, if we have to and say, you know what, for the sake of unity, I'm just going to let this thing, you know, let it go. We need to have unity. Verse 2, Paul speaks about, hum uh, about humility, gentleness, patience, and being loving. Every one of these spiritual characteristics flow out of a genuine love for one another. Do you really genuinely love your brothers and sisters in Christ? Do you genuinely love one another? I love every one of you. You still, I've told you that before. And actually Sunday I had each one of you to look at the other and say, Hey, I love you in the Lord. And uh, I thought it was kind of funny because I remember Keith um, simply yelled back at me, I love you, Brother Dwayne. Um, so, but we're to love one another and keep this bond, of this unity and the bond of peace. There is a plea that Paul gives out and that is to, to be in unity and harmony. We need to know God's will. We need to walk in this unity. Walking in unity does not mean that we'll always believe exactly the same but on every single issue, but where doctrine is concerned. We ought to always agree uh, and be in unity on that. It does mean that the unity means that we are marked by a common purpose, that we are led by our common Savior, Jesus Christ. It means that when the Lord gives us clear direction, we're to put aside our personal opinions, and we all have them, put aside our personal opinions, and walk together for the glory of God and for the promoting of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Unity means, um, it does mean that unity of the church is important uh, than getting our own way. Did you hear that? The unity of the church is more important than us individually getting our own way. It means that the unity of the church always comes ahead of my personal agenda. And it means that the unity of the church comes before even our feelings. Nothing shows the world uh, that we are different from them in our walk any more than being different in this area about unity. When they see us at odds, we forget the gospel because we will not reach them for Jesus. But when they see us walking in unity, it is manifest in true humility, gentleness toward one another, patient endurance of one another, and loving, uh, loving each other, even in spite of our differences. It will do more to reach the world than anything that we could do. Any division of man, when we're walking in the unity of the Spirit. They may reject the truth that we're trying to give them, but they cannot reject the fact that there is a difference among children of God. And that difference causes this sense of unity and love and harmony and humility and all these things that the Spirit of God is trying to produce in us. It is important that we are in unity and that we're in harmony one with the other. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to conclude tonight by asking you, is it hard sometimes is it hard to be in unity and harmony? Is it? Why? Pride. Pride. Ooh, wow. That actually was my number one. Yeah. Pride. That's actually God's number one, isn't it? When we're talking about sin, the first one God mentions that he hates is pride. So absolutely, pride. It's like, you know, I'm going to be right no matter if I'm right or not. And I mean, that's it. That's pretty much it. So absolutely. What else? Peter 5, verse 3 says, neither, neither is being Lord known with God's heritage, but being examples of the flock. Being examples. That's right. Somebody else. What would cause us not to be in harmony and unity together? Like you said earlier, everybody has their own opinion. Okay. Everybody has their own opinion. Our tongue. Tongue. There you go. 
following the biblical model for conflict. You know, Absolutely. 18, or, you know, if you mentioned it earlier. We don't go talk about somebody. Jesus said, go to the person. Mm -hmm. Talk to them. Absolutely. He said, harmony within the church body at a house of God cannot stand. That's it. A house to body cannot stand. Folks, I've said this before from the pulpit. You cannot do wrong doing it God's way. And many times a conflict can be resolved before it, it causes this thing about disharmony and disunity among the body of Christ. If we'll simply swallow our pride like Dan was talking about and we'll go to that person and say, look, you know, you've offended me. And we do it with the right attitude. We do it with a heart, the mindset of wanting restoration. That's the important thing. Uh, not because you want to tell somebody off. That's not the real reason to go to that person. You're to go to that person with humility and with love in your heart because the end result that you want is for there to be restoration from that between that brother and sister in Christ. That's the important thing. What else? Anybody else tonight? I should have brought my water. My mouth is like really dry. I'm having to keep licking my lips. <laughs> All right. All minds are clear as mud. All right. No, I'm just kidding. Well, thank you folks for coming tonight. And, and listen, from time to time, I talk about unity because I believe it's important. Um, I believe that this was the direction that God had me tonight. I don't know why. I don't know if there, I don't know. I, I'm, I don't know of anything that, is there's no where there's no unity and harmony, but I, I just want us to keep it in our forefront of our minds because God is really doing the work in this place, and I don't want anything to stand in that way. I really don't, and I want to always, even as your pastor, I want to keep that in the forefront of my mind. This thing about unity and harmony, um, you know, and, and so that God will continue to bless as He has been blessing. And you know, I'm so thankful for what you folks are doing. Um, I was talking uh, recently with someone and I said, you know, the Oakwood Church is great for a lot of reasons. But I said, you see church growth best when you see folks or that are really getting involved and excited about church and inviting folks to church. And folks, that's, that's really the fact that you folks are getting excited about the Lord and about His work. And it's, it's all of us together that are trying to reach out to people, and that's really what it takes. And God will continue to bless us, but we've got to make sure that this thing about unity is, is among us. Um, so, all right. Well, let's be dismissed in a word of prayer. All right, as we pray, Jimmy, would you please dismiss us tonight?